Let me get my little buttons pushed on here. Oh, there we go. All right. So, fabulous story of Ruth. Glad that you guys um, could all be here for this wrap-up time. I'm really excited to wrap up Ruth with you, but I'm really excited also to uh, move over into Esther, <coughs> which is our next new study. So, uh, for anyone who's new, brand new study starting up this coming uh, week in, in Esther, and excited to do that. Um, so, uh, there's a page for you to take notes if you'd like to do that in your packet, and you're welcome to just sit and listen, or if you are a note-taker, you can jot down notes. Um, feel free to do either one of those. At the end, I'm going to give us a quick little mini introduction to uh, Esther when we wrap up at the end of our time together. So, so the book of Ruth, as we all know, it begins with weeping and sadness and lots of loss, but it ends in this fourth chapter and it has this, this joyful, kind of the perfect happily ever after story ending. And little do the people even of Ruth know, but it's not only their happy ending right there, but the author deliberately leaves us with all these names that point to even a bigger future and that the happy ending is for us as well. We're included in that happy ending as well. In the book of Ruth, we see that people point us to Jesus. And so Boaz is set up in the book of Ruth as a reminder of who Jesus is in our life. He's what we call a type of Christ. He is the one that, as we look in the story, we see how he reminds us of Jesus himself. And so the book opens with three funerals, uh, and it closes with a wedding, right? Did you remember that movie, <laughs> Three Weddings and a Funeral? It's kind of the, the flip opposite <laughs> on that. But if you want to follow along in your Bible, go ahead and open up to Ruth chapter 4. Let me get mine heat up there also. <laughs> flip my pages, swipe over there. Um, <laughs> And uh, we open with uh, this part of Ruth. And I want to also say, as I'm reading through Ruth and talking through this closing part of Ruth, I'm going to drop some little bombs of hints to help you think ahead to Esther. Because there's some interesting things that connect us from Ruth to Esther as well. And the very first connection point comes in the very first words of Ruth uh, in this ending chapter. Now, Boaz had gone up to the gate. And the idea of the gate is going to play a role in our story of Esther as well. So get ready for that. And I'll just like give you little notes on that. If you want to jot them in your notes, you can, you can be, you know, already in the know when you move into Esther. You already know some of this stuff. So uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it starts, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, a redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz says, turn aside, friend, or... Turn aside, Mr. So-and-so, <laughs> right? <laughs> Literally. Sit down here, he says. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. And then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling a parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people if you will redeem it, redeem it. If you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. He kind of throws that in at the end. And, uh, and the Redeemer guy, Mr. So-and-so, says, I will redeem it. Sounds like a good deal to me. And for all of us reading this story and having gone through chapters 1 and 2 and 3, we get to this point in chapter 4, we're like, make it happen already, Boaz. <laughs> like, let's do this, right? And so at this point, when the Mr. Not-So-Redeemer, Mr. So-and-so says, I will redeem it, we're thinking, no, 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 no. We don't want the redeeming. We don't want you there. <laughs> and our hearts might stop. We don't want Mr. So-and-so to redeem it. Is this another setback, right? And is this, is this just going to flip the whole story again? And we've got these people who start, and their entire story is defined by setback after setback after setback. But... He's only doing the right thing. He's really only doing the right thing by stepping up and redeeming it. That is the right thing to do. So, I don't know if you know where I live. I live over the hill in Hacienda Heights. Some of you have been to my house. Mm -hmm. And um, the main way we get from Hacienda Heights over to La Mirada or Whittier is uh, Colima Boulevard. How many of you have driven up and over Colima? I had a friend tell me once, I've never been over there. I'm like... It's not like Nebraska. It's just like right there. <laughs> We've never gone over there. Anyway, Kalima is the main way if I'm heading to Whittier, um, La Mirada. If I'm heading to La Habra, La Habra Heights, um, Brea, anything over to the east of every all of that, 
I take Hacienda Road. How many of you have been on Hacienda Road before? There's a big Buddhist temple there. It's pretty. It's windy. It makes you think, like, I'm not in the city anymore. Right. It's very rural. Rural. Hard word to say. Yeah. Right? Um, and so if I, it, we spend a lot of our time on Hacienda Road because our bank is literally just ha- t- hop over Hacienda Road. And it's right there at the end of Hacienda Road, which is right next to In-N-Out Burger. So that makes a whole nice little errand, right? <laughs> so with the most recent rains, Hacienda Road got washed out. There was a big part of it that, that slumped down in the middle of the rain. And it didn't look washed out, but somebody noticed, reported it. And they came in and said, oh, wow, that's really dangerous. And they, they set it aside and they blocked it off. And I'm in the Hacienda Heights. Facebook group, and they said um, it's going to be closed until the end of February. I'm like, oh, bummer, that's like another week, that's going to be a drag. And then they updated it later, and like, well, no, it's going to be closed until the end of March. I'm like, what? At the end of March? No! And I'm like, I gotta drive over Kalima now, or I gotta go all the way down to Fullerton Road, Harbor, and all that over there. Boo. Yeah, and then they updated it again. It's not going to be open for a year. Oh, <gasps> yeah. A year. OC registered. A year. OC. I mean, it's all over the news now because it's it's displacing thirty thousand regular commuters, and they are now on my way. (laughs) 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 The detours happen. Things like this happen, and there's nothing unrighteous about the detour. In fact, it's a good thing because it moves me over there, but it prevents me from falling off a cliff. Apparently, in (laughs) Hacienda, Hacienda Road. So we open up the Book of Ruth with this detour from Bethlehem to Moab. And it was a bad, that was not good. Elimelech should never have done that, right? Mm-hmm. And then we have the deaths of the husbands. No one's, no one's fault here or there, but this is another detour in the story. And there's this, the barrenness of, of Ruth. And by extension, obviously, Naomi and even um, really our little friend Orpah. And so detour, 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 detour. Let's see, we have to remember that sometimes the detours that we are on, if you think of your life, I'm sure you can spin through your head right now moments in your life where you're like, that didn't go how I expected it. Mm-hmm. I wish I wasn't here right now. Mm-hmm. I wish that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Oh man, this, all these little detours that happen, right? But detours are not only for sin, results of bad behavior. They are just good reasons. And Mr. So-and-so is a potential detour that honestly, potentially his stepping up isn't a sin. He's actually doing the right thing by stepping up, right? So it's not what I would have wanted. We're reading the story going, don't end it this way. I don't want Mr. So-and-so. But you have to think about it and realize he's actually doing the right thing by stepping up. And we don't really know why Mr. So-and-so says that it will, in verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, he says it will impair his own inheritance. He goes on later to say, what? This will impair my inheritance. There's no explanation for that. We don't know. Maybe he's married. And it will legitimately take the inheritance away or have to split it with his son. Or, and that would be a you know, fair thing. Or maybe he's just a jerk. We don't know. It could be any one of the things. Like, yeah, I don't want some old lady and some other lady coming along. Who knows? They don't tell. But for whatever reason, he says, it's going to impair my inheritance and I can't do this. And the important thing is that, that his statement of righteously stepping down and making way does indeed make way for... Mr. Boaz, the guy that we wanted all along, right? And the one that we know in the end of the story is the one that God wants as well, right? So we move through um, Ruth chapter 4, and in case you hadn't noticed it, the key word in this chapter is redemption. We see it over and over and over. I think it's like 15 times in Ruth. Um, it, it, this, this particular chapter even is mentioned, I think, over 10. Um, redemption, redemption, redemption. And so when we go through this portion here, I want us to see, like we've been doing through the whole book, pictures of God, reminders of who God is. Like Boaz is set up as a a reminder of Jesus and points us to him. The entire story of Ruth points us to God and this idea of God being uh, our redeeming God. And so we move through this next portion here, kind of a checklist of what a redeemer has to do the requirements that the Redeemer has to make, uh, meet the, the resources they would have to have in order to do it, and the resolve, the personal internal fortitude or resolve they would have to have. In fact, in your lesson, I even had you kind of walk through all of that and make sure. We're going to, hopefully that's a review, and if it's not, that's great because we're going to do it again anyway right now. I want you to really understand this because this is such an important part of the story of Ruth. And what's interesting about this part of it is this keys into what I like to call, well, you know how the media refers to flyover states? Mm -hmm. You know, Kansas, 
Nebraska is like blah 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 Kansas blah you know Nebraska whatever I mean they actually literally call them yes, flyover right. states it's like no one's even going to pay attention mm-hmm. which is shameful and awful I am very nice people I know I go to no say so don't fly over them right but what is interesting here is God actually uses what I kind of think that we as Christians consider as flyover books of the Bible to be the books of the Bible that actually if you flew over them you're not going to even understand what's going on here and grasp the significance of them. So the reason why with everything that's happening with Boaz, Mr. So-and-so, Ruth, and this whole redeeming thing can feel confusing to us in America as women in the 21st century is because we maybe have flown over the books of the Bible. Like, we're like, I don't want to necessarily read that. For example, Leviticus. So probably your top 10 favorite devotional verses that you post on Facebook are not going to be coming out of the blood and gore and the laws and the regulations and the interesting kind of bizarre stuff from Leviticus, even the title, even the book name itself. But there's a rule, there's a law that God sets up. Leviticus. <laughs> that sets up the whole intent of this portion of the story and helps us to get it. And this is the law of what's called the kinsman redeemer, a family member, a kinsman, a man who can redeem or buy back things. And this is in Leviticus 25. And the law was really simple. It's basically there to protect widows and uh, make sure nobody ended up a widow. And so if a landowner goes into bankruptcy, has to sell this land, a near kinsman, a redeemer can buy back that land. And so if there's a, a widow or even a really poor person there, um, they can still have a home and they can still have family. The next one is this law um, called the law of leverate or leverite marriage. And that's in another 25th. Yes, I know. Deuteronomy, I'm getting there. Deuteronomy chapter 25. So they're both 25s and Joe preached on that this Sunday. So it was a big message. And thank you for not skipping over that. And we get to understand the law of love, right marriage with the Pharisees take in the new Testament and twist it to try to trip up Jesus. But the law states very simply that if a married couple has no children and the husband dies, the man's brother has to take the wife. And then, of course, the Pharisees extend that to its bizarre end. And Jesus has to go, like, really? Stop. It's not going to be even in marriage in heaven anyway. All right. So, <laughs> Leverite law and kinsman redeemer. Easy to remember. They're both in chapter 25 of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. All right. So, we learned that there are three things that were required in order for a man to be able to buy back the lost estate and marry the widow that comes with the state. He has to meet the requirements, he has to have the resources, and he has to have the resolve to do all of that, right? So in comes Boaz, (laughs) right? And we learned through our study that he does all three. He meets all three of those, right? So Boaz ultimately, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but Boaz ultimately points us and reminds us of Jesus Christ, who also meets the requirements He has the resources, and he has the resolve to redeem us. So if Boaz represents the Lord, who does Mr. So-and-so represent? Where's the connection there? Who's this other guy? That nearer kinsman redeemer who can't redeem? He represents Adam. He's Adam, right? In Adam, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, you want to write that in your margin of Ruth, you can. 1522 of 1 Corinthians. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Right? So the kinsman redeemer, the nearer one, the first one in line, like Adam, who we're descendants of, he would be our nearest redeemer if it weren't for Christ who steps in. See, our Adam is unable, we are unable in man to be able to redeem ourselves. There's nothing, there's no way that we can make our our lives right, right? We can't make that perfectly redeemed, right? So we have the nearest kinsman redeemer, Mr. So-and-so, who is replaced by our kinsman redeemer, Boaz, and points us, of course, to Christ. And if you remember in the story, in this account, When Boaz meets at the gate, he doesn't just meet there at the gate like, oh, here's a gate, I'll just stop here. The gate was significant. And it's just like us, we're like, hey, let's go to Starbucks. It's like any Starbucks we can go to. There's no significance in heading out to Starbucks. But if I said, let's meet at City Hall and take care of business, you'd be like, whoa, we're going to get some lawyers involved. Like, this is going to get real. This is 
what it meant to go at the city gate. They weren't just hanging out for hummus. They were actually... Maybe they had hummus. I don't know. Maybe falafel. Who knows? A little pita bread on this side. A little falafel. A little falafel, right? This was where business was conducted. So when he said, when he's at the gate, it would have been a visual cue to everybody involved. Like, oh, something's going down here. Um, and it's not just hummus. I mean, this is going to be business, right? <laughs> So he not only is he at the gate, but he takes it to the next level. And what else does he get involved? Ten witnesses. And I want us to always remember when we're reading the word, there was no mistakes. There was no additional extra words that shouldn't be there. Like maybe that was just forgotten. They stuck it in there. There's, it's very specific. So it's mentioned that he's at the gate and it's mentioned that he's got these ten witnesses, right? Ten witnesses. What's up with that? Well, we know just from the culture from back then that the gate was significant to where business would be conducted, but having witnesses around you is significant. So why 10? You don't have to have 10. The Bible says in the New Testament where two or three are gathered in my name, right? And that was true even in the, even in the Levitical law. You had to have other witnesses come forward to make something good. Now, there are instances of the idea of 10, but I want to suggest to you that this is another reminder of constant pointing forward to Christ and our ultimate redemption, just like every other book of the Bible ultimately points to Jesus Christ, right? In fact, the very uh, holiday we're going to get ready to celebrate, uh, if you've been to my house before for Passover, you're all invited, by the way. Everyone's invited to my home for Passover. I'd love for you all to come again. And uh, every every element of the Passover points to Christ. So elements that they observed back in the uh, when they left Egypt, and God says, do these, all these interesting, weird things, they end up all pointing to Christ. Well, guess what? The ten witnesses, I believe, point also forward. And um, I'm sorry, the, point, the ten witnesses point backward as well as they do forward. Here's why they point backward. Just like Mr. So-and-so reminds us of Adam, the Ten Witnesses remind us of the Ten Commandments. What do the Ten Witnesses end up doing? What do they affirm? What do they end up saying? Yes, we, we, we affirm that this is the right move. Going to Mr. So-and-so, away from Mr. So-and-so to Mr. Boaz is the right move. In the same way that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 Commandments point forward to Jesus and say, Yes, thank goodness for Jesus because we are incapable of fulfilling the law on our own. So the 10 witnesses stand as a testimony to that, um, that our nature in Adam as man can't save us. Listen to Romans 8, chapter 1, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Um, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sin and sinful flesh as an offering for sin. And what does the kinsman redeemer point us to that all the ten witnesses ultimately affirm? I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. In other words, I won't get an inheritance. This will not end well. So take my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. And in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews reminds us of, of this point as well, of Jesus and what he does for us because he says in chapter 2 verse 14 and maybe in our study some of you remember from the hebrew study you're like you remember that verse since the children have flesh and blood he too jesus shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death that is the devil see jesus is the one that's legally worthy not only that but jesus fulfilled all 10 of the commandments right our estate our inheritance was lost because of Adam's sin. We, we know that in Adam, all sin, all that death comes through that line. But Jesus is the one who fulfills it and Jesus redeems it. Let me support this with one other scripture because some of you are like, really? I don't know, Richmond. So I'm going to hop all the way to the end. Go to Revelation chapter 5. You know, every time I'm in the study and I'm preparing the studies and I'm um, doing research and, and bringing things together, it always puts it in my mind like the potential of the next book of the Bible we might do mm-hmm. in our study. And Revelation's I'm just not going to make that list. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> Every time I go to one, oh, maybe we'll study Romans next. Yeah, that'll be on my short list. Maybe we'll study, no, we will not do Revelation. <laughs> I'm not ready for Revelation yet. Who knows? I might change my mind by September. It's on my long short list. All right, Revelation <laughs> chapter five. Listen to this. Beginning in verse um, 5. No, that's not true. 
verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, God's on the throne, a scroll. Underline that in your Bible. Make note of it. In Hebrew, the word for scroll can also be translated the reading. And it is, uh, uh, me- I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but it's Megilot or Megilot. And um, Ruth, the book of Ruth, as well as Esther, are actually part of the five Megilot of the um, Bible. They are five scrolls or readings that are done on key days in the Hebrew calendar. All right. There's a little aside for you again. I'm nodding toward he- Esther as we move that direction. Who sat on the throne, God uh, had a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel. Now remember, I, this is John. And he's got, he's got this crazy vision. He's seeing all these things and he's putting it all into words and his emotion comes through. Listen to what he says. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? The scroll you see is the title deed for the entire earth. That's what the scroll contained. In other words, whoever opens that, can read this and open this scroll, is qualified to do that, is, gets the title deed to the whole earth. So this is everything weighs in the balance, and John knows as he feels the weight of it. Verse 3, but no one in heaven or on earth, or under it, so in other words, none of the good guys or the bad guys, uh, could open the scroll or even look inside of it. Like oh. The author is making this huge point here. I wept and I wept, he says, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. But wait. Verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And we see those names mentioned in the book of Ruth, also in the genealogy of Christ, of course. He has triumphed. The reminder is there. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. And it's capitalized there, although the Greek is all caps. It's just how Greek is written. But it is the lamb and it is pointing. It is Jesus, right? Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Jesus crucified, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which, and he explains what that is. Thank you for this one explanation, by the way, John, because everything else is like, what is going on? Which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. He went and took the scroll. Jesus takes the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Jesus is always mentioned at the right hand of God the Father, right? He takes the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls of incense, and which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. Listen to what they sang. You are worthy to open, to take the scroll and open the seal because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased or redeemed for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations. In other words, Ruth the Moabite, and all the Israelites and anybody else involved, your blood purchased from God. No one anywhere in any way was able or qualified to open that book. No one is worthy to open it but Jesus, the Lamb. Now listen, Satan is always featured as a dragon, the Antichrist as a beast. And who is set up against the dragon and the beast? Literally in the Greek, the word says, not just lamb, it says a little lamb. It's like to be diminutive, to say this little lamb is going to take on the beast and the dragon. You see, Jesus met the requirements. The humble Jesus meets the requirements (coughs) ultimately to redeem. And this is affirmed as we point forward from Ruth to our future now. And it's affirmed in the greatest future of all in Revelation, pointing backward in all of time that Jesus is the one that has the, has met the requirements to do that. Not only that, but Jesus, like Boaz, had the resources. So it, Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. Go ahead and hop back to Ruth chapter 2. Remember what it said about when we meet this guy Boaz on the scene. The very first time we get this introduction. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great uh, wealth, it says in the New American Standard. It might say worthy, I think, in the ESV. Uh, or maybe of standing, if you're reading in the NIV. Mm-hmm. So they're they're using this word, a um, the chayil, um, someone of great worth. But with that word chayil in the Hebrew, it has the idea of money with it, mm-hmm. not just uh, virtue 
and, and strength physical, but it brings with it the strength of resources with it in that wording. That's why I wanted to bring in the NASB's rendering of it, which literally translates it wealth. So he's from the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So <laughs> Boaz has the resources. He's wealthy. He's the guy in charge of everything. And Jesus himself has the resource to do it as well. Listen to what it says now. We're doing a lot of hopping today. So those of you who like to do your Bible hopping, continue to join with me. Those of you who prefer just to jot them down and ask me for my notes later, you're welcome. You can do that too. All right. First Peter 1. Hop again to First Peter. First Peter 1. Listen to how Peter describes what how Jesus redeems us. We all know that we were bought by the blood of the Lamb, right? But what is that blood? Listen to what Peter says. Knowing that you were ransomed, redeemed, from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, Adam, feudal, incapable, Mr. So-and-so, of redeeming you, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, which is what Mr. So-and-so and Boaz <clears throat> is able to redeem Ruth with, but with the precious blood of Christ. Christ's blood is gold. Christ's blood is the silver. Like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. And at First Peter three eighteen, we were to there. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. And here's, here's what I want to ask all of us here today. As I think sometimes in our walk with God and our understanding who God is and learning who he is, we get a little numb to that, the greatness of this moment yeah. here, that Jesus bought us, that we are his. And I think if we will take the time to think about how it could have been, that it didn't have to be this way. We could still tr be trying to keep all the Ten Commandments and getting, making right with God on our own efforts. But Jesus steps in to redeem us and says, no, put it on me. It's in my effort. It's in my love. Feel that. Love that. Don't ever lose that. Weep like John wept. That the scroll couldn't be opened. Who's going to do this? I can't do it. Who's there to do it? John's weeping for this. And then Jesus steps in. I got this. I can do this. Jesus meets the requirements and he has the resources. And Boaz is the picture of this perfect love also. But you see, Jesus paid the greater price than Boaz did, didn't he? Because Jesus didn't just pay with silver or gold. He bought us back with his own blood, right? So Jesus not only meets the requirements like Boaz. Jesus not only has the resources like Boaz. Jesus has the resolve. If you want to. The will to do it. You know, Boaz didn't have to buy Ruth. He could have stepped aside and let Mr. So-and-so do it. And the truth is that Jesus didn't have to buy us either. Jesus didn't have to do it. It didn't have to be this way. Jesus wanted to. What does it say in 1 John 4, 19? You don't have to go there, but just a reminder that we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. He initiated that love. He was like Boaz who looked out in the field and saw that Ruth and said, oh, I love her. Right? So, the story of Ruth is a picture of our own renewed life and what we have as a result. But you see, just like Ruth had three problems, we have the exact same problems that Ruth does. Now, we might not be um, orphaned and widowed and wandering around in wilderness land and gleaning fields. We're not like that. But the same three problems that she has, we have. And that's quite simply summarized in three words. Her past, her present, and her future. <laughs> Those are three big problems, right? Our past, our present, and our future without Christ are major problems for us. We have the exact same issues and the same problems that Ruth does. And if you will look over to Ephesians 2 or just listen, I want you to read a reminder to you from Ruth chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, sorry, Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 12. And I love the way Paul says to remember. He says, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ. You were not just separated from Christ. You were like from a different planet. And he literally says you were alienated <laughs> from the commonwealth of Israel. You were way out of reach, not worthy, not deserving, not being a part of what Christ has. Strangers to the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now in Christ you who were once far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Jesus. Jesus' sacrifice was the one that made that happen for us. 
So Ruth's past, like ours, is cursed, right? <laughs> Ruth was an alien from the Commonwealth of Israel. She was far off from that. Spiritually, she was literally like born on the wrong side of the tracks, right? That, yeah. She was not part of anything to do. She was a Moabite. So not only do we all die because of Adam, but she is like double die because she's cursed. <laughs> double die. <laughs> double die. Because remember in, in Deuteronomy 23, is God made this promise, a vow. He says, no Ammonite, no Moabite may ever enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the 10th generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Like big words from God. Like this is, you are not going to have any Ammonites or Moabites to have to do with, with you at all. And then God's grace comes in and says, but wait. So her past cursed, her present crushed, Right? She's a stranger to the things of God, stranger then to the things of Christ. She has suffered tragedy. She has gone through great loss. She does not have a family lineage that would bring her in at all. She doesn't have that covenant relationship crushed and her future condemned. Without any hope for her and from her past being cursed, her present being crushed and without hope, her future is ultimately hopeless without God. And Ruth then is a picture of all of us without God. In Ephesians 2, 19, it continues, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God. So like Ruth, we are able to be brought in because of what Christ has done for us. Amen? Amen. Doesn't that bring us great hope? In chapter four, the word redeem is used over and over and over again. I want to help you have a picture of this power of this word redeem, the significance of it in Ruth chapter four. That word redeem, we know, means can be bought, purchased back. I mean, you might redeem a coupon for something and you get something in exchange for that, right? It can also mean to buy out. It can also mean to be taken off the marketplace. It also means to be set free. And so when I was reading and doing my word study on the idea of redeem, I can, I. I saw and thought through about how, uh, and this is kind of a harsh visual imagery, so I apologize for it, but in my mind, I pictured the horrible time of, um, even today, of, of the slave trade and slaves being put on the marketplace. Yeah. And they're set up on that, that stand and they got their shackles on and there's, someone's bidding for them and they're being sold off. Mm -hmm. And it's evil and it's despicable and it's a terrible thing to have happened. But you know what? That's a powerful, hopeful, terrible image, but a reminder to us that that's our state, but that God has taken us off the marketplace. We're set free. We're down off that podium. No one has rights to us, right? Jesus did that for us. He's the one. When Jesus redeemed us, not only then did he buy us back, we're no longer for sale. We're not going to get back up on that platform. No more shackles can be put on us. It's done. It's ended. It's tied up in a scroll that won't be open and say, oh, you're back on the market again, right? So this reminds us of our eternal security. There's no need to fear. There's no need to wonder. Is this going to ever break? No. You're set. You're free in Christ Jesus forever. And then God provided for this freedom for us in Christ. And he didn't just point us to the law like he could have because the law was a reminder of our sin, if you remember from our Hebrew studies. It's kind of like when Jonathan was little, and I would say, you need to go pick up your toys and put it back in the toy box. And I could stand aside, and I could say, you know, do this or else type of moment with moms, and moms have every right to do that if you want to, it's fine, but it doesn't, doesn't preserve my point here. <laughs> I can leave him on his own, I can threaten punishment if he uh, doesn't get the job done, or I can get down on my hands and knees with him and help him put the toys back in that box and give him a job that turns into something that's fun. I'm there with him. One way produces a child of slavery, just doing it because you have to. And the other produces a child of freedom, of grace. Just like God reminds us in Galatians, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. free. And he didn't just point the way to you. He became the way for us. He didn't just redeem us and let us go. He redeemed us as one of us and showed us the way to freedom. So this custom, this really interesting custom comes up next in our chapter of Ruth. And maybe like me, when you were reading it, you're like, what? With the shoe? <laughs> I just picture some guy with the flip-flop holding it up. It just seems so like, what? 
He says he takes, he, he, he would have to take off his shoe and to seal the deal of this whole thing. Back in Ruth chapter um, four. Now this was the custom in former times. And it's like, even the author of the book is telling, reminding everybody, this was kind of old way we did things. This was the custom in former times. And uh, in concerning redeeming and exchanging, he says to confirm a transaction, like nobody would think anything about this. To conserve it, conserve, confirm a transaction, you just drop your sandal and give it to somebody else. Like, it's weird. So <laughs> like, I'm really glad we don't even do that. Uh, from So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, the Redeemer pulls off his sandal. When Jesus paid our price for our sins, he took our place. He literally, really, stood in our shoes. We're the ones that should have paid the ultimate price for our own sins. So as Boaz stands in the shoes, and that's what that transaction was like. It's like, you're going to stand in my shoes. That's the idea of that. That's even where probably our phrasing today comes from. Mm -hmm. Walking in someone else's shoes, standing in someone else's shoes, and things like that. In fact, uh, Pastor Jack from my former church... He used to say, I'm standing in Jesus' shoes. Jesus is standing in mine. I always thought that was such a, a beautiful way to say that, right? Second Corinthians 5 says in verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is a picture of a perfectly restored legacy. Ruth has everything now. She has a family. She's got fortune. And she's got things, really, everything coming together. In addition to that, she not only has a future for herself, she has the ultimate future. Because we see at the end of Ruth that it points all the way to Jesus, right? Ephesians 3, 6 tells us this exact same thing. Gentiles are fellow heirs, just like Ruth is now an heir with Boaz. Members of the same body, just like Ruth is now in the family with Boaz. And we're partakers of the, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus, just like Ruth is now in the lineage of Christ Jesus. We have that as well. So Ruth does receive this family in Ruth chapter 4, verse 10. I have bought her to be my wife, right? That is part of the deal. When we're saved, we are the bride of Christ. We were bought with his blood, and we become a part of the family of God. Not only that, but Ruth receives this great fortune, because as we know from Ruth chapter 2, Boaz was no schmo, right? <laughs> He was wealthy. He had it all going on. So she gets part of that. And here's the deal. It's not like you're my wife and I'm going to stick you in my harem. Right? And this is a nod over to Esther as well. I don't have you as my wife so that I can just use you and be look good in front of the village people. Right? <laughs> this is me bringing you in as my wife, as a co-heir. You get my fortune. This is all going to be yours as well, and our children's as well. So she receives this great fortune. Ruth's not gleaning in the fields anymore. She's not the wife, and then she has to get down on her knees and start gleaning. Although I think she's the kind of girl who would have been out there and help on everybody. She just seems like that kind of person anyway. But ladies, that's what you have as well. You don't, you're not out there gleaning in the fields like a poor person, hoping that God shines this light of mercy and grace on you. Like, I hope this all works out in the end, God. And I'll just glean in the fields and take my can and got the edges. No. You guys, you have the whole estate. You got everything. Never let the world tell you anything otherwise. You've got it all in Christ. You've got the kingdom. You are a co-heir side by side with Jesus. And he's like, yeah, we got this. You and me. As Christians, that's what we have in Jesus. Not only that, but she received the fame of it. I mean, we're reading about her today. We're reading about Boaz today. I mean, she's famous, right? Mm -hmm. The name of Ruth from that day forward in Jewish and then in Christian history was spoken of with great reverence. And it is to this day, whenever they read the Megillah, the scroll of Ruth, we call it the book of Ruth, but it's to this day still called us the scroll of Ruth. And if we know Jesus, we have that fame. Jesus' name is famous because of him, and we will reign forever with him. So Ruth has the fame, but she has the future, and that's the best. That's the most important thing. So Ruth, now Boaz took Ruth, chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, and she became his wife, and he went to her, and with God's grace and mercy, she is no longer barren. The Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. So Ruth receives this future because the author, again, points us to the genealogy of Christ. But what's interesting at the end 
of Ruth. We don't hear from Ruth. Boaz's time is closed as well. We don't hear any more from Boaz. We hear from the women and they all point to Naomi. The book is named Ruth, but it closes pointing and giving us this visual imagery of Naomi because what does Naomi step up to do in that moment? She's his nurse. She's holding him. She's holding the future. She's holding Obed. And for her, her story is beautiful and it's complete and it's come back and she's no longer bitter Mara like she was at the beginning of the book. She's blessed and she's full and she's pleasant again, Naomi, because she's holding promise. And for her, that's enough. She's got little Bo Obed, right? But we read the story and we're like, oh girl, mm. <laughs> it's like when you leave a movie, when the, when the credits are just starting and you're like, I'm just out and I'll leave the movie. And then it's like a Marvel or, you know, Avengers or something. And they have this really cool extra good scenes. It's like the end ends there. But really, we're here for the extra credits going, oh, this is going to look out so good. This is all going to end so well. You have no idea, Naomi. I mean, you're happy right now. And we're super happy for you being happy and all that. But we're going to get Jesus. Because it goes to Obed, to King David, and ultimately to Jesus. Little did she know. Ladies, I'm going to ask you to think about the same thing in your life right now. Consider the possibility that little do you know applies to you right now. That what you're doing in your life, the work that you're doing, the people that God is orchestrating to come into your life right now, the people that God brought into your life in your past, the, the, the work that you're doing, the friendships you're making, the church you're at, the, whatever it is, that God is bringing that moment together right now, and little do you know. And what if we lived in that anticipation and in that hopefulness that the credits haven't finished rolling and you're part of that if you're in the family of Christ, if you're part of that redeemed family that was pulled and saved by Jesus from Adam, that you're not left over by the sin of Adam and cursed as a result and left aside, that you've been brought in. See, Jesus bought us with that great price. Not just to give us a little happily ever after moment like Naomi thought she had with Obed, but to give us the ultimate, the great happily ever after, the biggest one possible. And so never, ever, ever believe the lie of Satan that your past defines your future or even your present right now. And all the crud and the crap and the difficulty that you've been through that has brought you to this moment right now isn't the end of the story. If you're in Christ, it's the beginning of your story and never, ever forget that the opening and the closing of the story mentioned multiple times that Ruth was a Moabite. Mm -hmm. She was part of the curse. So how much more could God be gracious to you? Because you're sitting there going, well, at least I'm not a Moabite. <laughs> right? I'm not like out there child sacrificing, like sure. murdering, and the things that the evil Moabites did. Right? God's got that blessing for you. The opening of our story, really at the beginning, uh, at the end, is 10 generations of cursing on Moab. And then the author specifically lists 10 generations at the end of blessing for everybody. And the spotlight again is on Naomi with Obed in her arms. And we open with these three heavy funerals. And we end with a wedding and a baby and promise. And God brings his people from cursed to blessed, from bitter to happy, and from empty to full, and from despair to hopeful. And Ruth 4.22, the last verse, is not the end. <clears throat> because the credits are rolling. And we're going to move through the life of Esther, which happens after Ruth. During a time of Israel's, another dark period of Israel's history. And it doesn't end there either. And it doesn't even end at Matthew 1, when the author lists out the genealogy of Christ. Right? But I want us to picture this, Jesus' name. Many things, many ways we refer to Jesus. Savior, counselor, friend, redeemer. But you know what encompasses them all, quite literally? He's the Alpha, and he's the Omega. He's the beginning, and he's the end. And so while the story doesn't end here, it does end in Christ, because he completely unfolds all of time. Jesus does. Jesus is the one that every single book, every single word, every number, every letter, every character of the Bible 
points to. And guess what? That's our life too, where it should be. Every letter, every character, every moment, every sadness, every joy, every tear, every laugh points or should and could, if you want true hope, point to Jesus. What a beautiful reminder of the love that God has for each and every one of us when we read through Ruth. And how exciting as we move into Esther that that love story is going to continue and it's going to be really different in how it's revealed. As low and dusty and uh, on the trails as the story of Ruth is, when you go to start reading Esther and you see the shift from a field and from grazing and at a, a, at a little gate where 10 people are and the witnesses and this little baby, you're going to open up the book of Esther and it's going to open with grandeur and a palace. And all the beauty of this palace is going to be right there in the very first words. I want you to anticipate that as you move through. And you know what's exciting? I told you guys this last time we got together. But um, when I was planning on doing Ruth and Esther, I told you last time that God had specifically directed me to do Ruth first and then Esther. And that I should do Ruth, even though I kind of resisted it at the beginning because I'd already done Ruth and a little, little steady, but God affirmed me to do Ruth. And then shortly after I make that decision, my mom gets sick. And of course, as you may know, my mom passed away. And, and thank God we did this because it enabled me to have mental energy to go through that whole season with my mom. But do you know what else is really exciting when I realized it? Do you know that the story of Ruth is set in a very significant time in Israel's history? And at that time, just like Ruth, that book of Ruth, the Megillot is read every year at a very specific season. Do you know that Esther is read as a Megillot at a very specific season? And do you know when that season begins? No. Tomorrow. <laughs> oh, wow. So the first day that you're going to be opening Esther is the first day of a, of a special festival in all of Israel, all around the world, are going to be celebrating, except for the di- diaspora, and there's a lot of that, but it's a long story. But that's like on Thursday. I'll tell you, I'll, you'll learn that later. But the official date does start tomorrow. Perm starts, well, I'll go into it a little bit more later. But it, I'll, I'll just finish it up, and then we'll go into a little more later. Um, but Perm starts tomorrow, and I'm going to open up the Bible study, and we'll, we'll get all that. So I want to encourage you, as you go into um, your study of Esther, to, to read it. <laughs> Enjoy it. Read it. But I wrote you an introduction in the very first page if you want to look. What page number is that on? Five. So on page five is the introduction to Ruth, uh, Esther. Don't skip it. <laughs> Do read the introduction. Uh, I know if you're like me, you're like introduction, blah, blah, blah. It's good to do good stuff. Like, but read the, read the introduction to Esther. I think it'll give you, I know it'll give you some important background material. And I want to encourage you to read it. The next thing I want to encourage you to do is uh, the next page after that, I wrote out like, uh, maybe it's on day two, anyway, whatever it is, um, to use highlighters as you go. And I, I've always encouraged you to do that, but in Esther, I'm going to really, really, really super duper encourage you to do that because unlike any other book we've ever written, uh, read together, um, Esther, the plot of Esther pivots on dates and, and times and locations It's really important to the plot. Whereas Ruth is like, I don't know, there's no dates really mentioned. There's a nod to a date because it says the barley harvest, but not a lot. Ruth's filled with dates. Uh, Esther's filled with dates. <laughs> Probably is filled with dates and grapes and all sorts of pomegranates. Anyway, um, so I have mentioned these types of pencil markers before. I happen to have, I think, just two left, right? So if you want to get one, they're 12 bucks. Um, I think it's just exactly what I paid for them on Amazon. Feel free to get these. They will help you um, because as you go and highlight, I want you to highlight through in your first read through because it's going to anchor you through the rest of our study through Esther. So please feel free. Use whatever you want to highlight, but these are easy and they're free. Not free. They're here and you can you know, get them for 12 bucks, like I said. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Let's close in prayer. Father God, you are good, and your mercies do endure forever, and we are the happy, blessed, joyful, thankful recipients of all of that. So right now, Lord, as we close our time in Ruth, we are feeling open to the promise that you have for us and thankful for what you're doing in our life. Um, And any of you a little concerned about what we're seeing in our own life and what's going on around us, God, help us to just trust you. Help us to just look to you. Help us to know who you are and to circle back to that truth even in spite of what we are going through in our own lives right now. And bless these women as they move forward in their study. 
um, with joy and enthusiasm and a love for your word like they've never experienced before. Uh, let us come back together uh, in a couple of weeks to, um, to share what we're learning and to rejoice even more in what you're doing in our lives. I uh, ask your hand a blessing on these women right now in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right.